Jai Hind, Jai Bharat, and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Chand, the Kargil Air War. Much has been written, much has been said, much has been spoken about in the past 24 years. This war was pretty much a turning point in terms of how things could actually happen in the Himalayas. High altitude battles are not something which any air force in the world, as a matter of fact, plans for. So a lot of stuff was learned as the war went along. A lot of things were innovated as the war went along. And that's something that we read from accounts of people that fought in that war. I have someone just like the same with me, Air Marshal G.S. Bedi, who has flown during this war operationally 25 sorties, 25 missions, if I may. And he probably has a little more insight and some untold stories to tell us about that particular war that the Indian Air Force fought alongside with the Indian Army. Sir, good evening and welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Adi. Thank you very much for this opportunity. It's indeed uh, nostalgic and your title is very interesting when you say untold stories. Uh, now, let me tell you, not that I'm going to let out any secrets, but the whole aim was uh, that, you know, you have informed audience. They uh, must have read about Cargill. They've heard about Cargill. You have done some shows on uh, Cargill. So sometimes uh, most of us know what happened. It is that how and why part of it, which uh, remains obscured to an extent or at times misinformed. So the aim would be that because I was there on the scene uh, to clear some air or, you know, bring out some finer aspects of uh, what happened or maybe cover some uh, issues which are not probably in the public domain or uh, in simple language, what I say, you can't Google them. So uh, looking forward to uh, having a nice conversation with you. Indeed, sir. Let's, you know, uh, Kargil was an unexpected war, if I may. And wars are normally unexpected, but... Uh, a lot of people do know uh, so there is a certain preparation which is on and this and that. This came suddenly out of the blue and it escalated right there. Uh, of course, how did it begin? And you know, one of the biggest questions people ask about air power because air power is a strategic sort of a you know uh, weapon. It's a it's it's not something that is used very very normally in normal countries. Let me put it across very clearly, but. Uh, was there any reluctance to bring in air power? Yeah, jagda next level pe chale jayega. How do we plan that? This, that. You know, they're, 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 you're not scared, but you want to be ready. Right? So, what did you notice in those days, sir? Uh, what, what, what was the feeling? What was happening? Yeah. Uh, see, uh, it started uh, the way every fight starts, you know, quietly. Now, uh, I was in 99, I was a squadron leader. I was flight commander of the resident squadron there. So uh, my account, how it started was uh, a lot of it, what I saw there on ground and some of it, obviously, I wouldn't have known what is happening in higher, uh, you know, quarters or higher in air headquarters or command headquarters because you have no access. And uh, to cover that part of it, uh, uh, what you're saying that about reluctance, etc., whether it was there or not, I would greatly depend on my subsequent education, you know, by spending uh, the next 25 years uh, in the Air Force in higher positions, uh, uh, being AOC, JNK, subsequently myself, you know, where I control this area uh, for over a year. Uh, so uh, coming back to how uh, it started, uh, you know, we all know the ground situation. Uh, I won't uh, elaborate on it, but just to uh, pick up the thread that, you know, uh, intrusions took place. We uh, were not aware of it. We had been placed under sanctions post-98. So America was not, uh, you know, uh, giving any intelligence, etc. So it came as a surprise that there were intrusions to put some dates. Uh, I guess 3rd May uh, is when army realized through a patrol or th through some, uh, not patrol, actually uh, some, uh, what do you call those, charvahas, etc. They brought some information that there are likely to be some people. And, uh, you know, one of these days, uh, I remember we were called, uh, we were uh, uh, doing our normal flying, etc. in the squadron uh, when our uh, coup, which is uh, chief operations officer, we call him coup, uh, group captain Dillon uh, then, he called us. He said, uh, just come to the base ops. So we went to the base ops. Uh, we were seated there. Uh, it was probably some exercise was starting. Nobody had whiff of it. And uh, there was an army officer, Colonel GS uh, of the local corps, uh, 15 corps. 
and uh, we thought it was some close air support exercise being planned or something. So while we were sitting and uh, our crew told him uh, that, okay, please uh, come and tell them. So he very uh, matter of factly or innocuous uh, statement he made. He said, listen, guys, uh, there have been some uh, intrusion. Some people have come and occupied uh, some places. We should take about 48 to 70 or 72 hours to, you know, vacate them. Uh, should there be a requirement of air power, we will let you know and you should be ready for it. So this was the kind of assessment uh, which was there in those uh, initial days. So what happened? Uh, 8th May, actually, their position was confirmed by one of the IAF uh, choppers uh, who noticed some activity uh, over those posts or over those hills where it shouldn't have been uh, there. So on 12th May, it was kind of reconfirmed when uh, Cheetah was shot at. It got its rotors damaged and it landed. So it was confirmed that uh, there was a problem. Now, in the meanwhile, I believe where uh, army... Uh, had uh, asked the AOC JNK that position I mentioned. Uh, AOC JNK controls the entire JNK area, you know, Jammu, Dampur, Shirinagar, Avantipur, Leh, Thois, all six airfields are under him, and a whole lot of, uh, I mean, complete forward area. What, what erstwhile, I mean, earlier JNK was completely known as before this, uh, uh, we made them into union territories or state. So now what happened is the uh, he was asked that, okay, give us attack helicopters. We want to, you know, evict uh, these uh, people. Uh, he obviously, he refused. Now, the reason for asking him was because uh, it, there were casualty evacuation missions taking place daily. Any requirement by the army, it will be informed to AOC JNK like we were doing day in and day out. And he would provide air support. But that charter was established. That charter was uh, kind of written down. This was not uh, in the charter that you will pick up, you know, armed aircraft and start firing uh, at someone. So he obviously said that, uh, see, I can't do this. Uh, it will need a uh, higher uh, uh, headquarters uh, authority. And in the meanwhile, I believe when the uh, things reached uh, higher up, the, you know, a lot of interaction between Army and Air Force took place uh, uh, at Air Chief's level, at uh, CNC's level, and uh, to start with the army vice chief, uh, because I believe General Malik, uh, who was the chief, uh, was at that moment out of country on an official tour. I mean, no one knew what was happening here. So subsequently with him, where uh, they were asking that you give us air power in, in the form of choppers, you know, that armed choppers should come and they, they will be most uh, suitable. Uh, but air chief was uh, kind of... Uh, uh, concerned that, you know, choppers in that area will be a uh, sitting duck. You know, they will have no uh, uh, sub, uh, no defense uh, in those areas. And so unless fighters were brought in uh, or complete air power, uh, you know, in its element is brought to bear, then this piecemeal uh, application of air power will be uh, counterproductive. As far as attack helicopters were concerned, they had limitation. You know, B-25s and B-35s, they had a ceiling or the uh, what you call a height limitation of 4.5 kilometers. And uh, they couldn't go uh, beyond that or higher than that. So they couldn't have been apply, uh, you know, employed there. B-17 was uh, a suitable uh, platform uh, with the uh, rockets. But what happened, uh, uh, you know, they were not obviously uh, pressed into service uh, because of this reason. Now, a lot of, I think, uh, uh, arguments uh, took place uh, at air headquarter level, you know, should you come in, should you not come in, in which way, etc. But then what happened in between the recce missions started, you know, our Jaguars uh, did some recce mission. They have that oblique camera, you know, they, by which they take photographs, but they were not very uh, great. And then we pressed Canberra and MiG-25s uh, entered, you know, we, they were flying then with the, their reconnaissance spot. But the turning point was this Canberra. On 21st May, this uh, Canberra had come from uh, Agra and it was flying at about 22,000 feet in that area, which will, you know, give you just four or 5,000 feet uh, of uh, height differential. And it sensed a trouble in this one of the engines. He, he felt he got hit, but he was not sure because no one was expecting it. And only thing is when he was retreating, he couldn't fly the aircraft. You know, he had to fly cross control. That means stick to one side, rudder to one side, because one engine was uh, not uh, behaving. So he landed in uh, Srinagar. And then detailed inspection revealed that actually there was a surface-to-air missile at Anza. You know, it's a Chinese uh, shoulder-fired uh, missile. 
so that is when things became uh, serious and uh, you know everyone realized that it's not uh, a, a simple thing so uh, something has to be done and i believe there was a ccs uh, meeting cabinet uh, committee for security uh, it has got uh, you know five key uh, ministers that is chaired by prime minister defense minister home minister finance minister and external affairs minister and that is when uh, it was decided that okay air power uh, has to be used and uh, chief was told on 25th may uh, at in the afternoon that okay tomorrow morning at uh, dawn uh, you know you can launch the strikes and now air power you know uh, uh, rightly so the chief probably asked him that you know what is the mandate or uh, can we go across the loc even if we have to fire in our own territory at least address it from the other side to which uh, the prime minister said very clearly that no no crossing the loc and that no crossing the loc was uh, you know respected or maintained throughout uh, the operation you know no aircraft ever crossed uh, loc so 26th morning very apt day you are doing this episode uh, ali today happens to be 26th may and uh, exactly 24 years before today morning uh, look mig 21s and mig 23s and mig 27s two two aircraft formations you know they uh, went up to uh, strike the uh, targets uh, uh, which were told to us by army we will come to that uh, how they were told and what were the problems and uh, along with me 17s you know uh, two formations five aircraft and four aircraft in formations uh, went they had uh, 128 rockets each and uh, uh, that is how uh, it started to answer your question how did it start so we had initially some bad news coming in two aircraft got lost one helicopter got shot at uh, as i as i was as i gave said in my introduction it was something for the first time we were you know any country was attempting to do an air battle at beyond 18000 feet uh, you know that's normally flying altitude <laughs> 18000 feet is yeah a very very high up uh, game so that's that's something which is very interesting to me that uh, you know the air force of course with losses okay but you're also learning as you went so how did that whole picture play out sir yeah you know it was unfortunate we had just started like i said on 26th may now flying in hills you know i i had got posted to this squadron just in december 98 you know from 7th squadron only flying rajas and uh, i was there was a requirement of a flight commander here so i was sent and you know what i realized there that uh, flying in those areas otherwise you fly at 15000 20000 feet you are like a king you know up in the air you see whole lot of things below you and you feel you are supreme and here in this area when you fly at 15000 feet there are mountains looking down at you you know that is when you realize that what kind of uh, things are you up against it's a very humbling uh, experience and now to fight in that area was a total different uh, ball game now um, see as far as the losses are concerned uh, what happened uh, we were in a kind of we have been say india as a nation because something had happened and quick results were required uh people were in a hurry to uh, do things so lot of you know rocket sorties bomb sorties etc went up as far as mid 27 is concerned uh, 9th squadron uh, nachiketa flight lieutenant nachiketa he fired his atmm rocket uh, i believe liver out of envelope you know what happens is every rocket rocket unlike bomb you know which is just released rocket is fired so it has a plume coming behind it now if you the engine is very sensitive to any air flow or disturbance uh, in front of it so uh, when he fired uh, his aircraft at height which probably were out of envelope uh, he had that engine uh, surge kind of thing problem because of which he uh, had to eject so this news came that uh, you know when he had ejected uh, which was bad enough you know that uh, he had ejected we were still not sure where he had, uh, where had he ejected uh but uh, generally what happens is when you're flying over hills and you have to eject you tend to eject over flat ground you know you don't eject over a hill you pi- pilot your aircraft to uh, a valley like you know valley floor so that you uh, you have enough height for your parachute to deploy and you come down uh, at a lower height 
So uh, we were still not sure where was he. So some coordinates were given, and this squadron leader Rahuja was on a recce mission. He was from 17 uh, squadron. Uh, then Wing Commander Dhanoa was the CEO. He was later our chief. And you know he was flying in that area when he heard that somebody had ejected. He took it upon himself to come and do look for him. And in that area where he was being, you know, told roughly where he had ejected, he was in a three tanker configuration. Three tanks is a very heavy configuration, and uh, he was there because he was on a recce mission. You're supposed to spend a lot of time in the air, so you need all the fuel. But in this particular case, while doing orbit. you know you need more energy he probably kept losing height kept losing height and he was struck by a uh, shoulder fired missile stinger heat seeking missile and now when he lost his engine uh, he couldn't uh, sustain he also you know kind of got into a valley to eject and uh, unfortunately uh, you know both of them had ejected in the enemy area both were captured uh, unfortunately you know as the later on uh, uh, squadron leader rahuja's body revealed that he had a close uh, uh, very close shot uh, uh, you know bullet uh, shots from a very close range uh, 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 fired on him or he was killed kind of thing so uh, and nachiketa survived because there were some more probably sensible people uh, who uh, captured him and uh, this is just happened on 27th uh, and you know i remember that scene in the evening it was a very uh, summer kind of uh, environment uh, chief tipness was there cnc was there and there was a briefing going on we were still we still didn't know till about evening as to what was the fate of these two pilots and uh, i remember we were all waiting when because we were the resident squad and another uh, phone came there and i had received call from air headquarters uh, which informed that uh, you know flight lift nishikita is pow and scotland or huja is uh, uh, no more so with a very heavy heart the briefing was broken you know i remember i entering that briefing room and uh, telling chief ke sir this is a news from uh, air headquarter uh, just very briefly and uh, came out so this was you know not yet absorbed in the very next day 28th may what happened when uh, these choppers v17 they, they were from 1 to 9 uh, HU four aircraft were tossed, and uh, now shoulder-fired uh, missile stingers were on the scene. We knew that uh, they are on the scene, so all the aircraft were, you know, equipped with flares. Uh, flares, uh, we understand, you know, they, they are divert the heat-seeking missile to a, a brighter source, uh, thus saving the aircraft. So what happened? One of the aircraft fell unserviceable. When one of the aircraft fell unserviceable, the fourth aircraft was slotted in. Uh, from 152 HU, which was not modified to carry out uh, flares, that particular aircraft. Now, in hindsight, probably he may not have joined. You know, three aircraft would have done uh, even if 75 percent of the job. It, it is not a big deal. But it was decided four aircraft formation, four aircraft were to go. So, best effort was done to launch the mission. You know, this is in our grain that you brief of something, you do something, then the best efforts are done that the mission goes as uh, planned. but unfortunately he was not uh, you know equipped and uh, i believe care was taken to keep him in the formation but uh, while attacking target you know you can't now maintain formation he probably uh, got a little away from uh, that shielding effect of other uh, aircraft flares and he also got hit by uh, this missile now chopper has no ejection uh, mechanism i mean when the chopper went down everybody uh, went down with him squadron leader kundir was uh, Uh, the captain of that aircraft so this is uh, you know in in quick succession we had this issue uh, then choppers were taken out of the scene you know from the very beginning what chief had been telling them that you know they will be vulnerable in that uh, area uh, so uh, we paused for a while decided on you know certain uh, more tactics and uh, the situation was tried to uh, be got under uh, control so this was about the losses which was uh, very uh, unfortunate to begin with but uh, uh, since uh, you know things had to be done they had to be done so th- that was about that i mean the loss of even one life is just too much but this kind of things normally that's part of the part of war it's 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 how it is yeah. so uh, <clears throat> you know hills again i want to come back to that we see these photographs of uh, the tejas today flying around in the dark and all that stuff uh 
and you mentioned a very interesting quote that when you know when you're flying at 15000 feet you see the mountains looking down at you so that's that's very interesting to me what's i mean do we really all the time before that now of course the with the lessons of kargil of course there's a lot of flying which would be happening in that region but did we practice for the, those kind of that kind of flying and that kind of attack before what were the challenges? What what? How did it go by? Sir? Yes, uh, not really, Adi. I, I you know I was uh, uh, at the peak of my uh, flying career at, at that time. You know, flight commander is the what they call the heart of the squadron. You know, uh, who's responsible for operations. And what happened is, Air Force never envisaged this kind of battle. Actually, you know, you fly in the hills, but you you fly in the hills, but you not uh, uh, fight. Uh, on the hills, you get the difference. That means I'm in an elevated area, but invariably the target, you know, my where I am, the target is in that same area. There is no reason for anyone to uh, target things on top of the hills. You know, uh, let's say if I have to employ uh, air power in mountainous uh, terrain, uh, where will I find target? Invariably, you will find interdiction targets, which are in a on a flat ground, on a on a plain ground, and your altitude is uh, same uh, where the target is. Now, here came the uh, interesting thing. Not only that we were, uh, uh, you know, uh, flying in higher heights. The typical phenomenon which took place here was that the altitude of the aircraft and altitude of the target were not the same. So what happens is when you do firing practice, when you do your gunnery, when you are bombing or rocketry, etc., you fire over a range where uh, the target is invariably at the same height where you are. The, the height differential, what I'm talking of, is the same uh, that of the aircraft. So the trajectory of the weapon is uh, so measured that, you know, how much time will it take to uh, come down uh, to that height and how far will it go? Imagine a bomb, you know, you're flying at 900 kilometers an hour. Uh, when you release a bomb, it has some forward speed. It will take time to, let's say I'm flying seven kilometers, some time to descend to by under gravity. Then how much will it travel forward? Then air is, uh, you know, acting on it as a resistant because it's not in vacuum. So all these calculations are done and forward throw of the bomb uh, is calculated. So you release the uh, weapon accordingly and sighting, you know, your aircraft sight uh, caters for it. But here what happened is uh, when you release bomb, there was a hill in between. Your target was on top of the hill. So while my altitude is at eight kilometers, the differential, like I said, was just four, five thousand feet or, you know, uh, five, five thousand feet. So things just won't work out. Uh, the you know the sighting techniques the uh, various things so people uh, you know had to struggle another important aspect you know uh, this firing is one thing location of the target now uh, let me give you an example you know this army when we started interacting with it now army has a way of looking at target so you would later read in the uh, you know literature that you know various points you know they call it point four three eight eight five two zero seven five two seven one point five three eight five etc so on and so forth these are trig heights that means they they are uh, these they are named by the elevation uh, at which they are so when you're standing on the ground a mountain or a hill peak which is at four thousand five hundred meters looks very distinct uh, from the one which is at five kilometers you know 500 meters of height difference is very easy to uh, discern but when you go up at uh, you know uh, twenty five thousand feet or you know uh, seven eight kilometers or nine kilometers this 500 meters of difference etc is of no consequence you know it, it just looks the same flat uh, ground I, if i have to draw an uh, uh, analogy i mean you know uh, take the case of buildings you have uh, on the ground you can make out which is a 10 story building which is 15 story building or which is 20 story building but uh, try uh, you know next time you are coming to land in an airliners or you're circling over an airfield or i mean over a city try making out which building is higher and which is lower you will not be able to make Okay, so same kind of problem came that when the targets were given that, you know, this target is at this, they would get the maps, they would get photographs from ground. So on the ground, you were very clear that, okay, the target seems to be here. But when you got up in the air, uh, you just couldn't uh, uh, locate the target. So that was the first challenge. 
and then became this uh, challenge of you know getting the direct i uh, mean the weapon solution on the uh, target okay. and then then came the problem of not being low you see how things got compounded why were people flying low earlier you know why did uh, nasiketa got hit or why uh, 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 you know other people i mean trying to locate things you had to come down to physically see that where is it you know you are you are looking for you are really searching now you are not allowed to do that 3 kilometers is generally the height uh, where a stinger you know travel so if 4.5 kilometers is the you know base height average height of the hill where targets are you are not to come down below 7.5 kilometers so where do you go up and fire so you are at 8.5 9 kilometers you know if you have to die and you have to pull out before 7.5 kilometers that is the height you have to uh, set your dive in and from there to pick up the target in the hill you know some bunker some etc and then the inaccuracies of your uh, weapon solution all this were uh, you know they are taking uh, time you know that and people were not really aware uh, what is what is happening or what is the effect to start with then what happened there was a like we said the mandate that you will not cross the loc now this this posed another problem see how it happened is uh, the mountains are slanting okay they're slanting both ways you have your own forces this side and you have enemy territory uh, on the other side so if your bomb undershoots i mean falls slightly short uh, let's say from the intended target at top of hill you will have to sort of imagine if at top of hill you fall short by 50 meters then you don't fall short by 50 meters because of the slant you'll fall short by 2 kilometers probably yeah probably over your guys and similarly if i overshoot 50 meters you know, it's not 50 meters it will now skip and you know go to the other side so which was uh, the mandate that you're not to do that so that was the kind of precision requirement uh, which had to uh, come from uh, this weapon solution but uh, uh, like we say you know ingenuity or necessity is the mother of invention then people sat down that what is to be done a lot of hard work was done we had a toshe medan range close by you know which was not activated for quite some time it is it is next to gulmarg it is also at about 4 kilometers 4.2 kilometers so uh, we quickly got our act together and uh, you know started practicing uh, bomb drops or you know weaponry on that got some kind of idea uh, how to do it and then a new uh, you know uh, innovation was done which was uh, gps aided bombing you know now people realize that you forward throw of the bomb Uh, from a particular height you know was almost same you know winds would make a little bit of difference and now it was you know gps and stop clock i tell you it worked over a period of time very beautifully i mean subsequently when people got the hang of it then you would fly level you don't have to dive you fly at about 8 kilometers 8.5 kilometers you have forward throw calculated and you designate you know coordinates of the target and now you go and release your bombs uh, there uh, and a, then weather did not play a role you know even when it was undercast you will be above that and you release your bomb and i believe there was a uh, intercept interesting intercept because uh, communications were being intercepted you know signal units were doing uh, when uh, these guys sitting there obviously when they saw air force uh, active i'm sure they must have you know demanded that their own air force also to come up which was not coming up or did not come up and there was one uh, call uh this uh, you know in urdu uh, this uh, soldier i mean uh, i would call still call him soldier he is telling as a uh, masters ke do something ke kuch kijiye badlon mein se qiyamat baras rahi hai you know what he meant that imagine it is overcast and suddenly you're looking up and out of the clouds took one bomb comes you know you you're not even you're not seen aircraft you're not seen anything and not one you know there will be number of them because a four aircraft formation has probably dropped four bombs each <clears throat> so this was the kind of uh, you know situation uh, which led to but again you know uh, uh, the non precision uh, weaponry had its uh, limitations you know it, it uh, could never be you could never be certain that uh, the targets would be addressed it was but what it served was to keep their heads down you see what happens is they they won't come out of bunkers if if i just kept dropping bombs which were even falling 50 60 meters left right etc the what very useful purpose it was serving that while army was advancing you know in close coordination etc for some time uh, you could you know really uh, keep them down and on the way i'm sure they destroyed uh, 
certain targets because we saw them only at end of the war so difficult to say which bomb destroyed what but overall effect uh, was what was uh, you know uh, required so this is how uh, these were the challenges and this is how we probably you know came across them yeah. that's that's the interesting part sir so now you know there was this little clip that uh, of a marshal dhanoa that was i have seen i'm sure a lot of people have seen that uh, particular clip where he talks about a uh, you know a, a pilot by the name of bedi and he says that i yes. went up with him and saw you know what's that, what's that story what was that flight oh yes no he is a great man i tell you imagine he was the ceo of the squadron 17 squadron and you know they had uh, just lost uh, his one of his senior pilots he was a squadron leader and they were to do recce missions and uh, now air force decided that we will switch to night this clip you are uh, talking about it's on youtube i mean people can watch it probably uh, after this we can post a link in one of the comments it's a interview given to vishnu som uh, on 20 20 years of uh, kargil victory you know it, it's in dras area where he's uh, asking him how did it go and he recalled that uh, you know when i uh, when we were asked to switch to night missions i was new to the area so i wanted to get familiar so i then flew a sortie in the trainer with the uh, then squadron leader vedi now a vice marshal i mean this is coat on coat is a statement i am grateful to him for you know remembering that and uh, recalling it uh, 20 years after that which is not a joke and he was chief of their staff then Uh, but what happened was you know like i told you i was flight commander in that area for about 6 months and we were familiar uh, with that area in hills you know uh, in mountains or in valleys uh, it's a uh, very different flying is very different you know your instruments your etc or your compasses can go haywire not that they misbehave but the orientations of the valleys are such that you can never be sure you know where are you going what is happening unless you have complete you know orientation Uh, i remember even subsequently uh, when we were training for my rest of the tenure and we used to go to lay or you know in that same kargil area to do sorties and while coming back to shrinagar we had this uh, features you know that k2 uh, parbat uh, that uh, hill k2 mountain and uh, i would you know tell people and that that mountain would be visible even above the clouds or even any weather that you know keep a look at that uh, uh, you know mountain if it, and going by the clock codes i said if you ever find that uh, mountain less than 2 o'clock to you you know that means you are going in the wrong direction you have to make sure that this this mountain always remains beyond 2 o'clock so even if your you know compass is misbehaving or something at least you are heading into your territory that is the and that is just one example i have given so he uh, you know they had not flown at night in that area and uh, this is the quality of you know good pilots or matured pilots i would say that rather than just jumping into something uh, he would realize that it would make sense to get familiarized uh, with that area and who was most experienced and he you know chose me uh, put confidence in me and we flew a, a trainer sortie uh, in the night where you know i just showed him around and it was a moonlight then you know at uh, snow clad peaks and everything could be shown and uh, we came back and uh, that is how uh, the night missions you know they became uh, confident and squad and then i'm sure he trained his own uh, pilots and subsequently the night missions uh, started uh, going and night you see because of the gps bombing uh, there was no no difference you know you didn't have to look at target you didn't have to dive down you didn't have to do anything you were uh, kind of uh, just flying level and uh, our particular squad and you know subsequently switched to a defense missions you know because a lot of these ground attack uh, aircraft came in and you required uh, a defense was primarily being uh, provided by uh, you know our mig 21s or 51 squad and mig 29s were there next to avantipur you know they were dominating the area and now uh, doing air defense with those missiles uh, at you know again 10 kilometers and you see now there are number of aircraft in the air so you don't have luxury to be just about anywhere you are allotted a particular level and you have to maintain that level and you are at the limit of your uh, power mm-hmm. you know when when you can orbit there and you can't afford to you know lose speed 
because your reheat won't engage below 500 kilometers uh, speed you know it will have problem let's say by mistake i dropped my speed to 450 what were the alternatives alternative was to either descend down to 500 you know descend lose height and build up speed before i can engage reheat but you have don't have that luxury because there is another formation orbiting below you and you can't afford to engage reheat or take a chance uh, below that speed because what happens if your engine uh, surges like it happened in nachiketa's case so that kind of care had to be taken you have to keep a track of uh, uh, enemy aircraft you have to keep track of what's happening listen on on rati and at the same time uh, fly your aircraft keep your number 2s uh, tail clear you know in some kind of uh, formation so all in all this is uh, uh, what was happening and uh, that was a story of uh, uh, air chief marshal denovas uh, that quick uh, saying where he said that if you that night trainer sort it nobody ever realizes that flying can be that difficult in terms of maintaining your uh, speed everybody thinks yeah punch it and you know that's what yeah. is seen in the fighter pilot movies uh, yeah so mirages what was the role you know uh, they were of course a very shiny new aircraft at that time what was the role of these these guys Oh, mirages! I think turned the table. You see, what happens is I just mentioned that uh, there were issues with precision. You know, when we uh, were bombing these uh, or carrying out these missions in these uh, aircraft, there were issues that uh, we were not sure. You know, what is uh, where are the bombs going? What is happening? And there was no way to know. Yes, some reports came from army. I would say they would tell us that yes, target destroyed. It fell on top because they could see from ground. you know some reports started coming when the trap uh, built up but it was tedious and we re, uh, you know air force realized that it will take long time that is when uh, chief i think decided to get the mirages in but now mirages will come and do what you see they had lgb laser guided bomb now they have a, a very a good facility available that you know that ldp that laser designated uh, pod uh, designation pod it it has a camera you know it looks at the target so you can look at the target you see you designate it and you release bomb but the problem with lgb this matra french bomber they were very few in number uh, available and they were bloody expensive and here as the things were you would probably need lot of them so this is again a- a- another accomplishment uh, i would say uh, you know uh, tremendous accomplishment uh, by golier uh, air base uh, uh, and ast you know this uh, aircraft system uh, testing establishment they uh, got together and what they did they, we had israeli lightning uh, pod and there were uh, paveway two american kits you know which uh, which you can fit on a standard mark 84000 pounder uh, bombs so it was a kind of you know if i can use the word jugad i mean much more sophisticated than that but a kind of combination was done quickly Uh, wherein a lot of these weapons uh, uh, became available so i think uh, just about 4 5 days later 31st may or 1st june it was decided that mirages uh, must join in and uh, this modification took about 2 weeks roughly i guess a uh, 12th or 13th june they were ready uh, you know to enter the fray and that changed the scene how because targets became very clear you know these guys would go they will film the whole area uh, in their uh, uh, you know that uh, uh, L, uh, from that pod and the pod records so now you come down and you play and now you ask you know sit with that army guy and ask him okay tell me here which is the target you know now he will see that he says okay this is the target and you could see some movement you know all these people saw the Uh, movement of uh, human beings there you know it because it magnifies it it gives you magnification to the extent that when you you know target a bridge you can uh, 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 put your cursor on the particular point on the bridge uh, you know top bottom middle or if you're striking a building you can designate a window uh, probably uh, of a building so with that kind of magnification and precision uh, when these people came uh then you know suddenly the tide uh, started uh, turning and they took on some very very uh, uh i would say uh, useful uh, targets now uh, this tiger hill became very uh, famous you know because of its name and because it was one of the last uh, it was a defining moment uh, you know when uh, uh, 
the victory was achieved but i think the maximum uh, effect uh, as uh, was uh, recalled uh, later uh, by one of our friends who took part in the war that uh, their uh, administrative uh, hub you know at muntu dalu or the training or the uh, concert or the camp logistics camp at muntu dalu that strike on that uh, did uh, wonders because there were a lot of casualties and uh, that broke uh, uh, their back Uh, so like then one target after the other whether uh, you know there are detailed accounts uh, available uh, sorties were flown from different uh, bases and uh, i think they they started flying uh, 17th june was one uh, major strike on muntu dalu then subsequently i think 24th june one uh, similar strike then 4th july tiger hill etc etc there are dates available but to it suffices to say that uh, you know when they started taking on uh, these uh, targets the uh, whole situation or uh, became very different and we uh, then became kind of confident that uh, uh, things were under control and uh, uh, we will be able to uh, uh, make a difference otherwise you see rp um, there were a lot of shelling the 15 core had pressed in uh, Uh, you know some 300 guns yeah, there there were mm-hmm. 15 uh, regiments uh, rt regiments into that and some 250000 uh, rounds were fired i mean it was probably count, uh, recounted on your uh, show only by some general i forget that how many rounds uh, were fired but uh, this precision uh, you know targeting is i think what uh, did the trick so this photograph behind me What's the story yeah. of this? I this see. Is... I've been watching this. <laughs> yes. Why? Why would she be singled out? You know, this. This is again available uh, photo. This is very interesting. You know, now, see, uh, this is uh, a- another aspect I want to bring. You know that uh, uh, the scene in Shri Nagar. You know, I was local in Shri Nagar. There were five, six cordon. There were uh, so many people, and a whole lot of people. uh came the public support was so overwhelming so overwhelming that i can't tell you you know now generally a lot of people had sympathies but what happens is the bollywood stars especially in 99 i mean they're still famous uh, people look up to them but 99 was a different uh, story you know the uh, kind of televisions had just been launched people just been launching that star uh, this what we know television as uh, today uh, i mean uh, star tv etc i think 1991 uh, they had just uh, come and now the there was a lot of craze about uh, these people and uh, i can't count how many of them came you know every actor and why uh, this particular uh, i remember we were in the mess uh, in it was about lunch time when uh, these people came and she was uh, one of them you know Ravina Tandon, and she very fondly we were all standing, and this big twenty-seven people were also there. She opened her purse, and uh, she showed. She says, "Come, come, I have to show you something." She opened her purse. I mean, I didn't recognize brands those days. I'm sure it must be very expensive. So she had been taken, or that troop had been taken to show them, you know, forward area, probably not very far, but. Uh, uh, somewhere there, and she brought a particular, you know, piece of uh, shell. and she said i have this shell this thing which probably they told me that it you know uh, it it is used in it was in the war since it was in our territory must be enemy shell that see i am i'm taking this as a you know souvenir that uh, this is what we were fighting against so people got emotional they said oh they have given you know you got this shell now we will send something from you to uh, nawaz sharif so this is where they got the idea that they painted our name they say the next bombs that we drop will be from you to her so this uh, uh, the airmen that you see or some people uh, they i think uh, took this uh, uh, you know idea and they painted on that bomb which came uh, it's now a piece of history i would uh, say that uh, from ravina tandon to nawaz sharif but the point you know i wish to make here see uh, adi i at times uh, you know feel uh, very sad or uh, very pity on the situation on the other side you know uh, let's say you are at war we know now that even they were regular soldiers you know it, it is not that uh, uh, they were our terrorists being made to sit there no soldier is a soldier we all right 
here on our side there is so much of public support every guy is visiting you people are saying walk up do something and now you have the guy fighting on the other side who's not even being recognized by his own people that you know later on we had uh, cases where you know they did not even claim somebody saying that no they are not our people what must be uh, those guys motivation to fight or you know what must be their feeling that you know when so much is happening in every war we have seen you know i've gone um, through 71 war uh, also as a child and i i belong to a border village and where we saw that you know when uh, army was moving in you know the villages used to put langar you know there was so much food uh, given to army people they never had to uh, make food and they were not uh, accepting that you know there was no place to accept that that kind of uh, feeling and on in this kargil only when you know the guys who got uh, killed in action their bodies would come to villages etc there were uh, you know ceremonial uh, funerals uh, for these people it would be shown on tv you know there was the state administration at strict uh, instruction that highest official in that area will be present in their uh, funeral you know uh, the guy had died you couldn't replace him but his family his people were so elated i mean you know by the kind of uh, Uh, emotions or the passion which was accorded uh, uh, to th- these people so same was the story you know in uh, shrinagar that the amount of aid the amount of entertainment the amount of troops the amount of people which came, you know came there uh, was just very great and one could feel that uh, it's the whole nation is you know kind of standing with it all it's just final guys uh... you know we got some questions of course this is a story well known we're just trying to hear sir's perspective there are there are there are a few questions here and uh, please do add your questions if you guys want to uh, add some stuff in sir last question with regards to your uh, you know assessment of loc nahi cross karna is you know for a layman like me when i uh, when i when i see it when i'm when i'm in the middle of a mountain and if i need to hit something because there are mountains i have to come in through the same way and you know infill and exfil from the same area i can actually exfil infiltrate from the exfil route or there are only two or three possible routes that you can come in and if i am smart as a enemy on the ground i'll know ye yahan yahan se aayega position yourself i mean was it actually practical just to do this and was that also one of the causes for accidents and stuff like that and the the shoot downs because at that time of course you also said that you know people didn't know what was happening but you were flying a you were obviously flying a very safe course you're not flying aggressive uh, this thing that that causes a little bit this thing would you agree with that sir Uh, uh see this is a tough question now i i have uh, uh, i am thinking while you're asking the uh, there are two uh, approaches to this you know one uh, if you ask me purely as a war fighter or as an air force uh, you know uh, war practitioner or a air force pilot like i said before uh, this was not the way the full potential of uh, air power can be realized you know the pilots did now what they could do not what they could have done you know the the difference between the uh, two because there was no need to actually address those uh, targets there you know you could have uh, hit uh, many uh, more uh, lucrative targets or choke them out or things like that etc etc this is from the uh, uh, war fighting point of view now but uh, you know when prime minister said that uh, no crossing the loc now uh, he was a great statesman i'm sure he must have done some calculation it was not a gamble it was not a head or tail you know it's not that he threw a coin up and he said if heads you will cross if tails you will not cross it must have been a very calculated decision we know uh, just as a one one no but what all went behind that no uh, I, i'm sure uh, uh, he would have his reasons but now if i have to analyze with so much of wisdom behind me of 25 years uh, later now uh, or and I analyze objectively now as a uh, not war practitioner but let's say student of military history okay now what were the objectives i would say if the objective was not to change the loc or the objective was not to occupy some area if the objective was only to evict these people then i think it was done in the best way you see what were the what were the pitfalls 
take a case I mean, you see uh, first of all something which has not happened it is very difficult to predict that you know what could have happened okay but a fair guess can be made or a fair estimation can be made now uh, uh, let's say air force had decided to uh, cross the lucy in, in its uh, true form then it is possible it's not that you will just uh, uh, trespass their uh, air space it is possible that some ordinance is dropped uh, thinking you know that uh, let's take this target or let's do that now it would have been now very difficult now in this whole conflict pakistan air force never uh, came up but if you were crossing to their side i think they would have had national compulsion to come up i mean you just can't keep uh, sitting on ground point is not whether a indian air force could take on them by all means i mean you know we could take out uh, more than an air force of uh, pakistan but the point i am alluding to is what would it have resulted into what would have been the scenario means what would have been their target let's say not only our aircraft intruding you know then if they get into action probably our army on ground also would have become their uh, target more casualties probably prolonged uh, 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 game uh, it could have you know uh, spread a little uh, more etc etc anything was uh, possible so here while it gave a feeling of restriction that you know we were not able to operate in a complete uh, uh, with complete freedom and it pinched uh, then as a squadron leader you know we every day we would come and uh, crib about it in fact that what is this way you know there is no way to employ air power we should do this we should do that but that was about all it will finish over a drink and next day you are ready for another sorty but what happens is the now like i said seriously when i look back and analyze the conflict that what was achieved in uh, you know that kind of uh, effort probably uh, you know may have gone a, a, a little more uh, in number of casualties in number of time probably or uh, you know or the extent of uh, spread and ultimately if you had to achieve this only i mean you were not uh, aiming to alter the loc i would still give in if there was a mandate that okay let's we have this opportunity let's alter the loc or obliterate it for all you know you know let's get back to our borders then yes it makes sense but if if the objective was only eviction of those heights then i think uh, in in hindsight it kind of uh, made sense but this is purely my personal view i i don't think i don't know whether uh, air force professionally uh, would uh, you know go by this uh, assessment or uh, people or the students of military history need to uh, stick to this uh, th- this is uh, purely my assessment since you asked i thought i must share my view so that's very interesting sir because you know i i look at it in a very different perspective actually uh, i'm looking at it from a more diplomatic perspective because india used a lot of restraint in terms of uh, not hitting back across the line of control across and damaging pakistani military infra- infrastructure we were able to exert that diplomatic heft on towards the us and everybody else who at the end of it called the pakistanis and said listen no means no you get yes. out so there was that legitimacy that you kind of were able to also you know uh, accumulate and that's something which i find that it was very very relevant at that time because uh, what a what you know when you when you're fighting a war one of the things that you're looking at and from the previous uh, i think 71 experience we would know that yaar ye sare piche pad jayenge to problem ho jayegi so just hang on let's you know today is a different day those days were different india 80 98 we just did the nuclear test uh, you know uh, and the rumors has it that the pakistanis had already started shining up the nuclear weapons when they yes. were called so the, the, there are a lot of dynamics and i'm looking at it from a purely non military perspective sir of course the military perspective is something that you've elucidated i am saying diplomatically it did help quite a bit uh, Yes, I'm, I'm sure to, it must have I'm, like. I'm uh, yeah. No, I mean the, this. This is what I feel, sir. Because you had the, you could you could walk up to the world and say, "Listen, I am just throwing these out guys out of my area, and I am not crossing their line. I am not doing this. I am not wanting to escalate. Tell them to Absolutely. get out. I will stop. If they don't, yeah. I will finish them. That's it. No, so that I will. Mean, uh, yeah. and statesmanship and uh, mind you when uh, uh, prime minister uh, uh, atal bihari vajpayee took that decision it was uh, just 3 uh, th- months after the lahore declaration was signed you know he had just been there 
and how hurt he must have felt you know just imagine a normal guy i, I just feel sometimes that in his position i acting like a normal that you you know step me behind my back we just said and now this is what you have done you know a guy can take a rational decision but imagine look at his uh, maturity and his uh, statesmanship that uh, that was uh, one thing and now he had concern of his uh, i guess the national pride and uh, i mean we i think uh, he was put into that situation he did not bargain for that even he must have been surprised what has happened this was not supposed to happen and now under that circumstances how to come out uh, clean and victorious uh, i think uh, without messing up too much i mean messing up did happen but still uh, i think the least amount which could not be uh, avoided is i think we uh, achieved the result uh, uh, with with least uh, effort i mean you know effort versus pay off i think probably was uh, uh, a very good efficiency uh, at the end of it that's what i mean one has to see it from a larger perspective we normally get very uh, emotional and actually have a look at it but uh, i guess the thought needs to be from a larger perspective to kind of understand what your actions can actually mean on the ground you know even even today when when the the attacks on uh, the attack on uh, punch happened there was a clamor in the country to kind of hit back but yeah. uh, we we very smartly realized that any hit back would actually benefit pakistan at that time so we will hit back and we will hit back but on yeah time and our, our own. In our so yeah it's it's a you know uh, one um, uh, the last point i wish to make in this whole conflict you know 26th may it started and about i think 12th july or somewhere was the last air operation and 26th july we uh, a kind of victory was uh, announced you know uh, uh, not a single case of a fratricide adi you know you were operating in such a close proximity of yeah. your uh, on your own army you know even when gulf war started the first case was uh, you know this aircraft hitting their own troops okay even that kind of network uh, centricity but here very primitive kind of network primitive aircraft to start with and army operation started in a kind of uh, urgency and uh, hurry but still uh, you know hats off to everybody uh, who was flying there on the kind of coordination that not a single uh, uh, air dropped weapon fell over uh, our own troops which i think if you look at it it's not uh, easy to achieve it's before the operation if uh, if you have to if someone has to give an undertaking trust me it is difficult to give an undertaking that something like this will not happen but we achieved that uh, fate very very difficult Right. Yeah, in Vietnam, multiple incidents of injuries and yes. Yes. close proximity bombing of napalm and stuff like that has happened. Let's get into the questions, guys. Like the video, subscribe to the channel. Most importantly, spread the word. Uh, you know, we, we've been covering a whole lot of subjects on the channel recently. Pakistan has been the flavor of the season. There's some stuff coming on China and a whole lot of other things, wide ranging stuff. So please tell people about this. You can join the group by becoming a member. or sending us a super sticker or super chat and you can also directly contribute to me with the qr code right above uday thank you so much for becoming a member of the youtube community uh let's go here yeah. close air support to ground troops is a must in modern warfare but we are still heavy on striking strategic targets need to shift to integrated operations just like western pair sir thoughts yes of course you see what happened is uh, this close air support a, a, a phenom you know uh, it, it depends the way one uh, understands it okay a, uh, the shift is uh, i wouldn't say there is a shift on uh, strategic targets shift would be wrong terminology i mean there is because as your air power increases you see I, when we i buy uh, a rafale aircraft let's say and along with that we buy scalp missile with 500 kilometers of range then what is it going to be used for if i do not have a plan for any strategic kind of uh, targets okay that is why there is a more talk about it you know because you have the capability of it now earlier you know for quite some time we did not have uh, uh, what uh, what we uh, call stand off ranges you know stand off range uh, uh, weapons that means where uh, the mother aircraft is kept uh, 
outside the uh, danger so probably there wasn't much talk of strategic uh, targets now we have the capability we have you know su 30s uh, with the air launched brahmos uh, capability you have you know which will go 400 kilometers you have 500 kilometers missile so there will be talk of strategic targets that does not mean at all that uh, you have taken away the focus from uh, helping the army because army's movement uh, has to be helped army ground operations have to be helped but sometimes it may not be visible you see what happens is what is close air support uh, the uh, if my army is advancing my as an air force officer or an air force pilot my aim is that nobody hinders advance of my army and conversely i do not let enemies uh, uh, you know army advance okay so that my army can advance similarly what would be the enemy air forces uh, objective would be same that he will not allow my army to advance and he would uh, help his army to uh, advance so now let's say at, uh, i mean i'm just painting a scenario if i am sitting on ground okay i am not airborne enemy aircraft is doing its job he is not allowing my army to move forward so uh, my army is hindered and now when i get airborne and take on that enemy air force aircraft in the air which does not allow him to interfere with my army then indirectly am i not helping my army am i not doing close air support of my army it does not really mean that i have to hit some targets on ground which are in the close proximity of uh, my army for it to be termed as a uh, close air support anything which uh, affects the advance of my army if i take on that whether it is the enemy ground forces or enemy aircraft in the air so you are helping your army to move forward which which de facto is uh, close air support so many a times this may not be uh, visible on ground that you know if you are not hitting any targets close by uh, you feel that you know uh, air uh, probably is not doing its job which is far from uh, truth so its presence it's whether it's taking on enemy aircraft or certain targets which is helping uh, uh, you advance is is very much close air support that's interesting sir when of course uh, there has to be a question of mig 21 crashes sir you been a mig 21 pilot i am one of the biggest fans in the world that you will find of for mig 21 uh, people give it all sorts of gullies and i feel really sad because that's i think one of the most iconic aircraft ever made after the mig mig 15 uh, you know a lot of people have western these things but these are aircraft that were made in numbers numbers that you will not believe 12000 9000 samples no western aircraft has been made in those kind of numbers it's never reached that level uh which is the question which i want to ask you what's your take on recurring mig 21 crashes sir why does this keep happening humor error fault with the machines how come no other jet uh, jet pilots are faulting if it's human error see uh, again uh, this is uh, uh, you know to start with i think when we did one small episode on flight safety uh, or big 21 or i keep saying you know uh, i uh, uh, love answering this question because in my last uh, position from where i retired i was a director general inspection and safety and uh, trust me the statistics you know will be uh, uh, i know them like back of my hand no mig 21 we all know uh, we say old aircraft old aircraft you know yes it is old aircraft no doubt about it we have upgraded it you know but it's still called uh, mig 21 uh, more crashes visibly uh, uh, take place uh, pilot error in some cases yes but what happens is uh, now the focus is shifted uh, you know air force rather than pilot error just terming it at that we uh, tend to go why did pilot uh, make that error you know for what quite some time earlier that we had training gaps you know you would know that we did not have that advanced uh, jet uh, ajt you know, hawk mm-hmm. uh, trainer so people you know from very like i i myself you know uh, in our uh, course we directly from kiran you know we went to mix which was a great jump you know suddenly because hunters also uh, were faced off earlier classically it used to be uh, uh, your training aircraft then you went on to hunters then you uh, came on to mix but slowly hunters went out and you came directly from kiran to uh, mix just like going from and, maruti 800 uh, to a ferrari sir directly absolutely okay 
and now what happens is the uh, so lot of uh, issues you know that uh, pace of training and uh, another important aspect we did not have simulator for me 21 you know there was a, a very old simulator which was more of a procedural trainer you know that you could sit and uh, practice your checks and procedures and you know fly to some an extent but fields etc and there was one uh, here and there and i remember our squad and moved from pune to uttarlai and from uttarlai we used to come to pune to fly simulator you know that was the kind of uh, stuff so people would it it the one fact is there that uh, it was less forgiving aircraft you know you understand that means uh, not that you go and uh, i mean kill yourself in that aircraft but if you made a mistake it was not very uh, forgiving you know you you had to be very very careful uh, throughout but if you looked after that aspect that uh, you know you did everything right then probably uh, you were not let down upon at the most uh, yes machines uh, do go wrong and uh, we have had cases we, you know where uh, people eject out of the aircraft but what troubles uh, the air force is the fatal crashes you know where you lose a human being and uh, which affects the morale uh, of the air force and losing aircraft definitely uh, causes dent on the operational uh, preparedness uh, of the air force you know it is uh, if you uh, even google the statistics it will tell you how many were the number of squadrons we have uh, lost uh, by crashes crashes take place all over yes mc21 uh, uh, had an issue and now uh, they are uh, being faced out it is becoming old now the another problem has come is that most of our uh, you know air uh, pilots or something they are a different breed you know they are more tech savvy they are more video game types they find it easy to fly mirage 2000 or a rafale or a su 30 probably but uh, to fly mig 21 you have to be very very uh, you know basics very careful very uh, disciplined and uh, some kind of you know fly by uh, feel uh, that yeah. feeling has to come so sometimes i think some of our pilots you know uh, at times uh, you know lack that when machine troubles you uh, they are uh, you know unable to uh, handle uh, that situation uh, it is time for these uh, uh, aircraft to be phased out we are left with only three squadrons i think uh, overall potential of the air force has to be maintained so they have some life left but due care is taken uh, that uh, you know uh, not more than uh, what is the general kind of accepted uh, uh, standard uh, uh, things go wrong you know i don't know if the air force still does it sir because there used to be a tradition when in, in a in a in a station if there was a crash everybody used to take off at the same time yes it it you know, does we've done it uh, so many times because but actually you know what happens is nobody feels anything i, I remember i was in uh, air force academy and you know some news comes yeah uh, training aircraft that somebody has ejected or somebody has force landed or somebody has crashed in the dhpt what do you do you hear it you quickly run to the aircraft and you know get into uh, fly and uh, uh, to, that i'll go and you know look for him very uh, very easy that feeling does not come uh, in your mind why because you have confidence you know pilots know that their aircraft is not bad you know when i sit in the aircraft i don't have that feeling otherwise nobody you can't force nowadays anyone to fly something which is not trustworthy i mean you know can you it's not bonded labor in the air force people uh, you know they don't get i mean just on the lighter side they don't get posting to their place of choice people you know represent and i'm sure if if anybody found that an aircraft was not okay to fly he will not quietly sit in the aircraft and go i mean you know there are uh, 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 armed forces uh, tribunal is there you know see how many cases are there in aft people representing against wrong things you know so i mean that that much freedom is there so i would believe that any pilot you know who can represent uh, for any wrong thing yeah uh, will definitely bring it up in case he was being sent in a unsafe aircraft the aircraft to begin with is not unsafe everybody knows it that is why he gets into that aircraft and goes but yes uh, uh, i i would agree on one and i used to uh, tell uh, drive home this point that you know uh, people need to pay more attention towards uh, safety and uh, Uh, being uh, you know safe is being more efficient and uh, uh, both the things are not contradictory to uh, each other but sometimes when you uh, you know miscalculate that uh, mishap happens absolutely that happens even when we are walking on the road yeah 
Rahul asks, so your take on MMRC A 2.0, which is not going anywhere. Should I go for 36 more Rafales? That's a common question. But this is an interesting one, sir. How would the Indian Air Force respond if hypothetically Kargil 2.0 happens as IAF now has Apaches, LCH, Rafales, Su 30s, and etc.? Oh, yes. Uh, you see, now, uh, you see, first part of the question again, it's a, a political decision, I guess. Uh, you know, what kind of. Uh, uh, preparation HAL uh, has got, you know, they have, they have said they will be able to uh, wake AMCA in some time frame, okay. But, you know, uh, be rest assured that tomorrow if the requirement comes, you know, take the case of uh, uh, Pilatus trainer aircraft also. You know, when we fell short, we did not have it. We went ahead and bought uh, trainer aircraft. I mean, there was no reason not to buy it. Similarly, uh, Rafales, you know, nothing was working out. I mean, after all, government took decision in spite of controversy or something. The national interest was supreme, you know. At, I mean, uh, uh, I would say at the, at the, uh, the gamble was the political dispensation completely. But the government took decision that, okay, if this has to be done, this has to be done. So similarly, if a requirement comes tomorrow, to, you know, MMRC is not coming up or somewhere, we are not uh, uh, catching up. The, uh, the decision may be taken to buy which aircraft, I don't know. It, it could be uh, anyone. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, today only I was uh, uh, attending some defense conclave and someone said very nice uh, thing that, you know, we are definitely working towards uh, Atam Nirbhar Bharat, but Atam Nirbhar Bharat has to remain Surakshir Bharat. So it will always be Surakshir. And along with that, we will we are uh, progressing uh, towards that. So uh, I think that question aside. Second, Kargil 2.0, we are far different from what we were. You know, uh, in our episode of that surveillance, we said we had no worthwhile surveillance. You know, there were hardly any satellites. They had some 70 to 70 odd meters of resolution. Uh, no support, no UAVs, no nothing. And uh, aircraft that I counted, MiG-29, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, was the best air defense aircraft. And uh, Mirage 2000 were there, just two squadrons at that time. Okay, and of course, Jaguars and other uh, legacy aircraft are there. Now it's a different uh, game ball. I mean, you know, you are uh, forget about Kargil 2.0. I mean, we are ready to take on uh, uh, much uh, more uh, difficult situations. The whole networking center, the way we operate now, is entirely uh, different. So I think to begin with, the wherewithal is available. That is situation of Kargil 2. Uh, you know, will not come. You know, the way we were caught unaware will not happen. But I, I understand you are referring to an operation, you know, not why it happened. It could be any time. But in case that was to happen, then I think we would be uh, more than prepared to take on that. Jack Ma says, what weapons did you fire? Oh, we, uh, in the Kargil, essentially, uh, uh, he must be meaning, you know, initially what happened is uh, because uh, Targets were not uh, sure, so rockets were the uh, preferred choice because they had a spread, you know, the uh, and the they were a little more accurate. You know, what happens is bomb is a free fall bomb. So it could go and land up anywhere. You know, you did not have and uh, have a... yeah, drift, etc. Right? It's purely going, it's time of flight is hell of a lot. Okay. And, uh, you know, um, uh, earlier that MiG-21 that I flew uh, at that time was Type 75. It was not Bison. It did not have uh, this kind of uh, the upgraded version which we are flying uh, now. Uh, Type 75 had a very, uh, it had a gyro kind of gun sight. But like I said, you could not use it in those uh, hills, the, those target height differentials. So initial emphasis by these aircraft was essentially on... Um, uh, rocket projectiles, that is 57 mm RPs that it uh, carried 64 uh, at a time. So you can imagine, you know, they were much more accurate and cover a little bit of area of uh, design. But soon uh, after that, our squadron, you know, when other uh, aircraft came in, uh, we shifted to a defense role and then we would be airborne uh, with our 60 MCA missile those days, uh, you know, the MiG-21s uh, could carry. Uh, good missile, I have fired it on a uh, target aircraft also. I have a small uh, video sometimes, probably if opportunity comes, I'll show you where I'm piloting the aircraft and uh, I fired that R-60 missile, zook it went and uh, hit that uh, flare. So that is the weapon uh, we had, I mean, which I particularly uh, find. 
did the Pakistani try to escalate in the Western in Western India with the recce aircraft, Atlantis? Not sorry, with uh, say again the last. It is uh, in the same relation, or the Atlantis incident, sir. Oh, interrupting. Yeah, yeah. No, not really. You know, that must have been a normal, it was not escalation. You know, if it was escalation, it's a shooting down would have laid up uh, things, you know. the uh, But what, uh, I don't think there was any activity. I mean, why escalate in the Western sector? There is no presence even there uh, in that sector uh, also. So I don't think, I mean, what they were thinking exactly, I wouldn't uh, be able to say, but there was no manifestation of that, I would say. Uh, yeah. Rahul asked once again, uh, how effective are Israeli lighting pods used by IF in mountain strikes? How effective are the scalp JDAM hammer spice bombs in mountain areas? Will they work the same as in plain areas? Oh, yes. You see, what happens is the, these are very advanced uh, weapons. Litning pod, uh, uh, you know, is a good, it's an LGB uh, pod uh, day night, it will see. Okay. So uh, it's got a very good uh, capability. We have uh, associated uh, uh, weaponry with it. This uh, scalp hammer, which we are talking of, very uh, uh, f uh, wonderful. You know, scalp is actually British, uh, they call it storm shadow, French call it scalp. So uh, we have got since French version, so we also call it scalp. I have seen it physically while. Uh, I was in London on Typhoon. A very a beautiful piece. Uh, and it has got uh, advanced. You see, these weapons like Storm Shadow, etc., they have, uh, they don't only go on uh, coordinates, they also have their terminal seekers, you know, that IR uh, seeker is there, which will now see the target and, you know, uh, uh, do the needful. Okay. And Spice uh, has got an imagery in it. Uh, you know, you feed uh, imagery in it and it correlates the mm -hmm. uh, target. So uh, what happens is uh, it, it will go wherever you uh, send it. Your coordinates have to be correct. I mean, somewhere close by. And thereafter, it will, uh, you know, the target that you feed in uh, on the image, it will correlate with the image and uh, go there. Very, very accurate. SPICE, incidentally, is an uh, acronym. Stands for Smart, Precise, Impact, Cost Effective. So th that is what the bomb is all about. And we use the same in Balapur times. Isn't that a good way of selling a bomb? <laughs> yes, of course, probably. Yeah. I was just, uh, Batraji says, I was just uh, spellbound and mesmerized with the narration of uh, Air Marshal, sir. No ah, question popped okay. up in my head, uh, mind during the sir's narration. But I have a question on AMCA capabilities that the Air Force is looking for and network centric warfare, what capabilities India has, has achieved? Oh, uh, you know, MK capability, we are essentially looking at fifth generation, I guess. I mean, you know, you already have 4.5 generation aircraft with you. So it will probably be a kind of fifth generation. Uh, when you capability. say fifth, it's stealth, right? It's stealth, essentially. Yes. Stealth is a part of it. Now, you know, uh, that, that becomes a kind of uh, a given that uh, it will have that uh, capability. Uh, and uh, some other uh, aspects, it's in overall, uh, uh, you know, upgradation of... Uh, probably weapon carriage, the kind of missiles that will carry, the stealth capability, the network-centric capability. Currently, you know, none of the aircraft, we, we don't have net-centric, uh, like Link-16, you know, American, the way it works. It does not, uh, we still do not have that capability. SDR software-defined radio, you know, SDR capability is being developed, and it is very soon it will come up in uh, aircraft, you know, that is where the network centricity will come. But on ground, we have, uh, you know, uh, made great strides. You know, we have uh, uh, IACCS, you know, integrated, uh, uh, it's a whole network kind of uh, system. I, let me explain the capability first. Uh, imagine yourself that uh, you're sitting in Bangalore and you can control an aircraft uh, flying over Shirinagar. So that is a kind of capability you have. So it is complete area, irrespective now. You are not, uh, you don't have to sit on the radar there only. Okay, it is a uh, whole uh, area, you know, all your radars are integrated, they feed into one source, and all those pictures are available uh, everywhere. So that is kind of uh, capability, you know, uh, we have achieved integrated air command and control system, IACCS, what we call, it. okay, so uh, great net network uh, centricity is enough. 
last couple of them sir we yeah yeah all the time for you sir the uh, views on guerrilla tactics for air defense and offense not conventional i guess he's talking about gray zone in air power in the gray zone sir uh you know uh, uh helicopters i would say yes i mean we are kind of leco kind of situation a low intensity conflict operation if he's uh, uh, referring to uh, then yes uh, helicopters uh, uh, very effective and now you know uh, the drones have come on the scene you know they will be very i think they will take over the scene for this kind of uh, at least battle from the Uh, manned aircraft manned aircraft in any case you know just imagine i i just uh, recall the kind of difficulty we had uh, addressing targets by fixed wing aircraft where still there was some kind of demarcation you know but you did not know they were still in the open you know the, i mean uh, they were uh, visible there but now gorilla warfare you know they are in urban kind of environment they are hiding here and there they don't know i don't think conventional air power will uh, have much of role fixed wing definitely uh, not but uh, helicopter yes to some extent we uh, do deploy it in uh, you know some areas uh, but drones i think with this capability that is what uh, needs to be developed uh, for this kind of uh, operation and uh, that is why army is going in uh, uh, for large acquisition uh, in terms of drones you know and when the armed uh, uh, drones come they will have a good role to play indeed sir that's you know sir last question is there any hope to watch a jet drone any time in the iaf soon yes soon i don't know but uh, definitely yes you know what happens is this uh, you know that uh, kaveri engine which was uh, being made for fighter aircraft it's still some a little bit of uh, you know thrust shot uh, for lca but i think a variant is being made uh, uh, to fit it in uh, Yeah, drone. So if that succeeds, then we will definitely have a jet engine uh, drone in the IF inventory. I guess they should use the MiG twenty one. As them. you know, in, uh, probably if he had enough uh, air frame, you know these drones. Unfortunately, uh, are they? You are right. Uh, okay, MiG twenty one may be uh, too huge. but you know at one time we had uh, HPD thirty two. If you would remember in two thousand eight mm-hmm. nine nine, they were suddenly grounded. we had 100 airframes you know which we just sort of uh, uh, they were lying and you know the way drones have you know grown now and when i look back uh, i mean what a lost uh, opportunity i would say you know whole lot of them could have been converted HPDs, into hpd is i mean uh, i wish they would have stored the nats nat would have been a perfect dead drone yeah. I mean, I think they just went as a scrap somewhere, or you know, we gave it to some educational institutions to just put them here and there. Scrap, so I know, sir. UP Agra में मैं कभी factory है ना वहाँ पर वो बनता है airplane metal की कढ़ाइयाँ बनती है. Yeah, okay, probably. So uh, otherwise, you know, uh, forget about normal drones. But what, what a beautiful Kamakasi drone it would have made. You know, fill up something. Uh, our simple Lion GPS is what it would require, and just launch it, and you know. Uh, potent uh, weapon you would have had 100 of them but I mean, anyway. to me so the most interesting thing is the fact that uh, we have airframes i mean we have the airframe designs and i keep hoping that somebody would pick up the hf24 marut uh, for what little knowledge that i have the airframe design and everything is fantastic and it's even valid even now so all we need is two good engines and i think we should be able to revive that as as a good medium fighter bomber sort of a you know yes of course uh, yeah so engine probably will come i think the uh, there is a uh, quite a bit of push uh, that this technology so is, that deal uh, is going to get signed there? now so when he goes uh, when pm modi goes to us the okay. g deal is getting signed that's for sure yeah so hopefully so that will be good thing yeah that will be a huge set of engines made in india anytime you can that's that's there but you know that one aircraft i really feel bad about that was something yeah. that if we would have actually succeeded in that we would have been i know ages ahead today as far as uh, you know ages ahead as far as a- a- aviation technology is concerned i'll take one last one sir uh, yes, this please. is an interesting one i can't miss it so if you use on s400 many analysts say that it can shoot down pakistani aircraft before it can even take off from the runway 
no that's an overstatement and why would one do that okay hey, s400 is for a different purpose you know this is for uh, kind of a ballistic missile defense you know that is which is more dangerous so s400 will not be used it, it you know as the name suggests it's uh, 400 kilometers now let me explain 400 kilometers range provided the aircraft shows up at 400 kilometers it essentially remains line of sight so an aircraft lying on the runway at 400, uh, you know, in Pakistan, if it's not visible to me or to the missile, then it has got no mean. Uh, you know, S-400 against a target on ground uh, will be four kilometers range, you know, as far as you can see. So it is why we say 400 kilometers, because you, uh, you take a ballistic missile to be very high coming from, you know, you yeah. will definitely see it. Uh, 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 much uh, farther off. So this is uh, where it will be able to intercept. I mean, I guess that is not the role. A, a Shahid kind of drone is what should be used for aircraft on the ground, not S-400. S-400. Rahul, I'll, I'll actually implore you to read what is integrated air defense and what does it mean in terms of how the ranges and how the heights are categorized, what kind of weapons are used for those particular ranges and then uh, you know, how the S-400 fits into that integrated uh, air defense system of India. Sir, correct me if I'm wrong, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no, absolutely. The, there is a, you know, there is area defense, there is point defense, there are so whole lot of uh, uh, things are calculated, you know, the how do you, the, you know, India has a lot of uh, arsenal in uh, a surface-to-air uh, category, you know, S-400 is uh, a part. And uh, you have MR SAM, you have Akash missile, indigenous, you know, you are uh, other systems are there, OSAs are there, OSAs, Pichoras, I mean, even if they're on the last leg, okay. But uh, LR SAM will come up and a uh, whole lot of spider missiles are there, okay. OSAs so, I've seen. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. They used to do those missile testing, no? uh -huh. so I've seen those decently yeah. about four and a half, five feet long missile. Yeah, SAM-8 it was called. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, it's nomenclature of SAM-8, like Pichoras or SAM-3. SAM-3. Yeah. I mean, there are these uh, pictures are there. So, guys, you can actually OSAKA, Osaka, it was called Osaka oh, M. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you can see them. There, there are loads of these things which are which are available. Oh, I think uh, sir has got disconnected. I'm not sure if sir can hear that. But, you know, uh, this has been interesting. Although, you know, I, I must say that a lot of people don't want to get into history and stuff like that. But I really enjoyed this particular show because we are learning something from a pilot's perspective that we can't read in a newspaper, we can't read in a book, we can't read in a, uh, a, a you know, this thing. These are things that are not told. These are things. And Air Force as it is a little restrictive in terms of what it puts out because at the end of it, one must understand Air Force, anything to do with the Air Force and its stories and stuff like that, we may also give out the tactics and may also give out the systems. And Sorry. Uh, no problem, sir. No problem. My, I was just... Uh, <laughs> this is Gurgaon. Uh, Gurgaon uh, and uh, the, I think the lightest is gone. <laughs> no problem, I, was just, uh, I was just rounding up. Uh, and I was saying that, you know, I'm grateful to you that you've come out and spoken because Air Force... Very many people don't uh, speak because you know it's 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 a very technical sort of a force, very technical game altogether, uh, which becomes a bit of a little bit of a challenge sometimes. So thanks so much for taking out the time and you know, uh, of course, uh, telling us your experiences and from an active uh, fighter pilot at war to uh, somebody who's telling his story. I'm sure it's a great experience that you can reminisce whatever happened in those days. Thank you so much, sir, as always. Until next time, Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adi. It's a pleasure. I'm sorry for this last minute. Not <laughs> glitch, at all, sir. It, it, it sir just, everybody uh, knows I, what we are going through. You know, some busy, of our but, yeah. are Summer, uh, you know, they're troubling everybody, I guess. Thankfully, but thank I'm, you very I'm much for this opportunity. Where, thankfully, I'm in a place yeah. where I'm sitting in two, two number fan. Everything is cool. <laughs> Temperature is 23 yeah. degrees right now. So I'm happy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Adi. All the best. Thank you, sir. And thank Jai you, Hin. everybody. Thank you.